Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Penn National's approach to responsible gaming. You know, promos promoting responsible gaming is a foundational element to not only our Ohio properties in Toledo, Columbus, Dayton, and Mahoning Valley, but also the Penn National company across the country. Uh, our responsible gaming goals, if you had the chance to listen to Jim Baldacy the other day, um, you may have heard some of this, but our goals include providing responsible gaming training to all individuals that are employed with us. That includes training at orientation and then follow-up training throughout their career with Penn. Enhancing guest awareness of responsible gaming by providing access to responsible gaming literature throughout our properties. In addition to uh, our property specific website and the Penn National Gaming website as well. We also wanna establish procedures designed to prevent underage, visibly intoxicated, excluded, and voluntarily excluded individuals from wagering at our facilities. Uh, also, we are looking to prevent underage, those excluded individuals from also receiving gaming or marketing materials or in some instances when they've elected to limit their financial transaction ability at our properties, uh, making sure that we have those procedures in place to limit those transactions. And then finally, we wanna make sure that we have procedures designed to prevent adults from bringing minors onto the property and to ensure the safety of any minors that are located on grounds. So I just wanted to spend a, a quick couple minutes just kind of giving you an idea of the different departments in the casino or our other properties, what our responsibilities are from a department to department perspective. So it starts at human resources. Again, when people come in, they're responsible for training all staff. And some of the topics in that training uh, include identifying signs of problem gambling. Uh, we definitely want them to know about the voluntary exclusion program here in Ohio, which of course is maintained by the Ohio Casino Control Commission and the Ohio Lottery Commission. Uh, they do a fantastic job with that. And um, as I think Jim mentioned the other day, in Ohio, folks have the ability to sign up for an exclusion for one year, five years, or a lifetime. And employees are trained on how we can identify those individuals should they attempt to enter the casino. And in the event that they do make it onto the casino floor, how to respond uh, to those individuals. Other topics in training, again, include underage gambling and responsible alcohol service. So once you leave your orientation and you move on to your departments, uh, it, it really, the, the duties are everywhere. So at the cage, where our patrons handle a lot of financial transactions, team members are on high alert to look again for underage individuals, individuals who might be excluded, individuals who may be intoxicated. And if they uh, suspect any of those things, they work with our security and surveillance teams to coordinate a response and determine you know, what action might need to be taken with that individual. Food and beverage, uh, the same thing applies, of course. Really the focus there is uh, making sure that we're not over, or we're not serving to intoxicated individuals. Um, in marketing, our marketing department, make sure that excluded individuals are restricted from receiving mail and also all advertisements that go out, whether they be in print or over the radio, making sure that those advertisements promote responsible gaming. Uh, security and surveillance, again, they are our front line preventing these underage, uh, voluntarily excluded or intoxicated individuals from, from getting into the casino. And uh, finally, of course, compliance. Uh, myself and our teams at, at all the properties uh, we make sure that the operation is adhering to our responsible gaming program and ensuring its effectiveness. We do this in a, in a number of ways. Um, for example, our team will walk through, do frequent walkthroughs and making sure that our responsible gaming signage is prominently displayed, that we've got the literature available throughout the floor. We'll also go around and uh, do interviews with our staff and just say, hey, what do you know about the voluntary exclusion program? Um, and then other topics, just making sure that uh, if there are any gaps in knowledge that we see it maybe more of a trend that we can buck that trend and get people on the right side of things. Um, well, if, you know, we also, I think, um, Mike, you mentioned this, we work with treat treatment professionals and invite them onto the property to share information with our patrons. Uh, special thanks to Bruce Jones. I saw that he's on the participation list today uh, from Mary Haven. He joined us back in September during Responsible um, Gaming Week. So that was great to have him out. 
Um, and then finally, uh, each property has a responsible gaming committee, which meets to discuss any responsible gaming related incidents or um, if we have any changes we want to propose to our responsible gaming plan, those would come up for the committee to review. So, um, you know, one other thing I'll quickly mention is that in addition to the state's VEP program, Penn National Gaming's policy is to exclude a patron from all of our 40 plus properties across the country when somebody signs up to be voluntarily excluded in any of our jurisdictions. So for example, if you were to sign up in, in Michigan at the Greek Town Casino and a few weeks later try to come in and down to Toledo or Columbus, uh, we have our systems in place to identify those individuals and um, you know, escort, escort them off the property uh, because we do think that it's a larger commitment for our property um, and it's something that as, as Jim said, there is a lot of work that goes into it, but we're happy to do it. We think it's the responsible thing to do. Um, so again, if anybody hasn't had the chance to visit one of our casinos, Mike, I know you mentioned some of the opportunities we've had in the past year and a half working together. Uh, I'd encourage you to work with Derek, Mike, Corey, or you can reach out to me directly and we'd be happy to walk you around it. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that people might have and it's just easiest to really show you, get the boots on the ground and see what we're all about here. Um, now, having had the opportunity to tell you a little bit about Penn and our responsible gaming efforts, it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Trelaro. Dan is the Assistant Executive Director for 800 Gambler in New Jersey. He's spoken around the state and the country on topics including the dis-ease of addiction, emerging trends in gambling, and the convergence between video gaming and gambling. Dan's favorite phrase is rules without relationships leads to rebellion. Please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to take a moment to share my screen, which is queued up, teed up, share computer sound because we have a video. I think it's always good to break it up a little bit, <clears throat> even for one hour and change um, keynote and start of the day. Welcome, Ohio. It's good to be with you virtually today from my office in central New Jersey. Um, it is March. I'm looking forward to warmer weather. It is St. Patty's Day Eve for any of us who are Irish because they always say everyone's a little Irish on St. Patrick's Day. So today we want to take uh, about an hour or so and just kind of take a look at what's happening around the country with a topic that's really rapidly evolving, which is sports betting, but also emerging trends because what we see with sports betting oftentimes is internet gambling. And so for, for states that have not yet implemented sports betting or legalized sports betting, there oftentimes will come along a companion bill or some companion legislation that also talks about or, or authorizes internet gambling within the state <clears throat> because that's how you deliver the sports betting very quickly. I wanna let you know, I'm the assistant executive director at 800 Gambler, and we are neutral on gambling. We're neither for nor against. The mission is to help the problem gambler and the loved ones of problem gambling, okay? Because the family is impacted so greatly and so deeply on this issue and any issue, addiction in general. We always have to focus on the loved one and family member. I will save time, uh, ideally 10 minutes, more like seven or five <laughs> at the end of the uh, session today or some Q&A, some questions in the chat. So type in your questions. I've already shared my email address. I usually forget to do that, <clears throat> but this time I was proactive. You have my email address. So if there's a thought, a concept, uh, a comment, something you wanna kick around a little bit further after the session today, I'm happy to interact with you and, and be of service however possible. So let's get started here. Let's take a look and see what's happening in the state of Ohio. Now, this was as of February 1st. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we had our, our workshop uh, submitted in time and presentation submitted in time. Now, I have gone back as of this morning and started updating a couple of uh, additional slides and numbers, but let's take a look, because not much has changed, honestly, from whether it's February 1st or March 1st or now March 16th. There's still no sports betting in the state of Ohio. We know there's things in the works. We know it's been in the works for some time. And we understand that COVID-19 has played a part in slowing the process. There's no exact timeline or date, but it's not a question, as I read in a recent article uh, coming out of Ohio, it's not a question of if, but when. And so it's just a matter of time. 
But let's take a look at what some of the other states are doing to kind of keep this in context. So as of February 1st, according to Legal Sports Report, <clears throat> 21 states had offered some form of legalized sports betting, roughly 40% of the country. 15 of those states offered some form of remote legalized internet or mobile device gambling. New Jersey and Nevada are the top two when you take a look at handle uh, for sports betting. Take a look at this. Now, just so we're on the same page, I like to give some definitions. I think it's important that we understand what we're talking about. I hear it in New Jersey misrepresented all the time. Someone will say, oh, uh, the state of New Jersey made 11 billion dollars. No, they didn't. The state of New Jersey brought in revenue. That was how much the sports book brought in, first of all, 791 million. The state takes the taxes on the revenue. So when we look at terminology, it's very important to understand what we're talking about. Handle is the amount of money that's bet, the pure dollars that are wagered on sports. In Nevada, 12.6 billion. New Jersey was 11.8 billion, right? Tennessee, in a partial year, did amazing numbers to start. You could see Michigan, $130 million already in just that short, very short period of time in the month, I believe that was uh, January, February, uh, from June 2018 to date, but Michigan recently legalized. And then when you look at revenue, that's how much the operator, the sports book operator takes. And then from that revenue, that's how much money that they've kept out of all that money wagered. That's how much money the sports book operator made. And then the taxes are collected by the state or the jurisdiction, right? So let's not confuse the numbers. But what's important to note is the amount of money that's being wagered on sports legally. This is captured numbers. We know people are wagering and gambling more than what's reported here in the handle. This is just the legal capture, right? This is what we're seeing. And that is one of the benefits. And that's why legalizing sports betting after the repeal of PASPA in 2018 is good for the industry in the sense that it tries to keep more dollars on shore because it's not as if sports betting was never being done. Sports betting has been going along, around for a long time. It's just in the United States outside of a, a few states pre-2018, it was largely illegal, offshore sites benefiting or the illegal bookmaker down on the corner. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to A, by legalizing it, bring revenue and tax monies in state, in jurisdiction, providing jobs, and we're also reducing stigma. And the reason I say that is because when you take a look at this slide, in New Jersey, we have been tracking since the first full month in 2018, July 1 of 2018 was the first full month we had legalized sports betting in the state of New Jersey. Every month since that time, our agency has been tracking handle, uh, as indicated by the red bar, relative to what percent of people are calling with sports betting being their primary issue or their primary reason for calling our helpline. And what you tend to see is a connection between amount of dollars wagered in handle and the number of people calling with sports betting as the primary. And you can see the cyclical nature of sports wagering. We understand football season is very popular. It is singly the, the single most popular sport to wager on in the United States, not to be confused with football over in Europe, which is the United States soccer, right? So we're talking American football, whether it's college or professional. And you see certain months, there's higher handle. And then you can see the summertime, it lags a little bit because there's less sports going on as well. You have baseball season, but NBA finishes in June. So you get to July, you primarily only have baseball happening. Football has not started yet. Hockey has not started yet. And, and, um, and basketball has ended in June, right? You fast forward and you can see in, by year two, October, November, December in the middle, you can see handle approaching almost $600 million for November and December. And then it tails off in February of 20. And then what happened? We see COVID. We see the impact of COVID very clearly on this chart. You can see when sports were shut down in March and all the way through July until August when they started to resume, the people calling with sports betting as a problem really dropped. I will tell you that we have a, a companion chart 
that shows the spike in lottery play, as well as the spike in internet gambling, internet casino gambling. Because in New Jersey, we've had legalized internet and mobile device gambling since 2013. So when you have that in 2013 and you have sports betting in 2018 and you marry the two together, it's no wonder that almost 90% of all sports wagers are done online in the state of New Jersey. And then you can see the effects of the surge as I move my camera to the left side so I can see the right side of the chart. The last several months through January 31st of this year, the handle has been approaching almost $1 billion wagered in a month. But we're also starting to see upwards of 20 to 25% of our people who call are struggling with sports. And the numbers for our helpline just came out last night and we have now set six consecutive months with over 115 intake helpline calls. To put that in perspective, that six month total equals what we've received in 12 months each of the past three years. So our volume has really picked up with the emergence and growth of sports betting. Ohio, be ready. We understand states differ. We understand population, demographics, resources, dollars. We understand it, but be ready because while the numbers will not mirror just the general concept that when something is introduced that is new, it is legalized, we've reduced the stigma. People feel more comfortable calling for help about something that was previously illegal. So when you remove that illegality and you remove the stigma, because there are so many great programs going on around the country, whether they're radio programs, podcasts, we're really starting to shine the light on those who struggle with a gambling problem. And it's okay. Just like people struggle with drugs and alcohol, and we talk about the importance of mental health and mental wellness, it's okay to talk about and, and be accepted and to seek help for something that we struggle with. And we're starting to see more people calling and or reaching out for help using various resources. So when we talk about gambling, we also have to recognize that a majority of people can gamble responsibly or socially. They don't, it doesn't present a problem in their life. And, and I like to think of this along a continuum, right? We think that somewhere along a continuum, 90 to 94% of people can gamble socially and responsibly. But then, you know, six to 10% will start to experience some type of gambling related harm, again, along a continuum, and then a small percentage as disordered gamblers. The state of New Jersey uh, did a survey out of Rutgers University with Dr. Leah Nauer, I believe it was about three years ago. And what they found was in that survey that New Jersey had three times the disordered gambling rate, three times the national average. So if the national average was somewhere around one to 2%, New Jersey was somewhere between three to 6%, three times the national average. And a lot of that has to do with the ability for internet accessibility, rapid reinforcement, and we will talk about that a bit later on. So when we think about types of gamblers, we have a continuum, social, fun, entertainment, they enjoy many of the amenities that a property might offer if they're going in person. Uh, they have dollar limits, they have time limits, they, they do so responsibly. But then we start falling along a continuum to the serious, the professional, and then we start moving into the problem disorder gambler. So we have a continuum. I think the main takeaway here is that for clinicians, social workers, therapists, on the phone, even on this webinar today, family members, loved ones, whoever you may be, if someone starts to experience a gambling problem, have that conversation, right? Awareness and action. We have a couple of different themes around the United States this year for uh, messaging on Problem Gambling Awareness Month, but having a conversation, letting someone know it's okay to talk about the problems that they're having and coming at it through a lens of compassion, not a lens of comparison. And so we start opening dialogue and knocking walls down when we can start doing those things. Gambling is a hidden addiction. It is so hard to diagnose. Clinicians, if we're not asking the question, how are we going to know the answer? We ask oftentimes about someone's substance use. I understand there will be several of you on this webinar today who specialize and work in the world of substance use. And that's wonderful. But are we asking questions about their gambling? I took a helpline call last night, as a matter of fact, around 9.30. Uh, the, the mom was referred to me uh, from a mutual friend. And her 24-year-old son 
is in recovery from substance use. Uh, he is now a mentor. He's a peer leader, so he's doing rather well. The unfortunate part is that he has now turned to gambling. And every time he gets his paycheck, every two weeks, within two days, his paycheck is mostly gone. And so it's, it's amazing when someone doesn't really see the parallels in the behaviors between addictions, right? We understand there's differences between substance and non-substance related disorders. However, the behaviors oftentimes are similar, the lying, the cheating, the preoccupation, right? So we start to think continuing despite negative consequences. And so we started having a conversation and I provided her some resources and offered to speak to the son. He'll be calling me at intending to call me sometime later this afternoon. But we have to ask the questions because if we switch addictions to gambling, that can lead us back to the original drug of choice, which could have been the drugs, the alcohol, whatever it might be. So gambling is so difficult because of the intermittent reward schedule. A gambler has been conditioned to know that he or she will win every so often. The problem is threefold. They don't know how much they will win, how often, or when it will occur next. And that's the nature of gambling. That's the nature of the addiction, the anticipation, the reward schedule. And it is so difficult to give up an intermittent reward schedule when you know that next wind is right around the corner, that next win is right around the corner, and it can take you out of this hole. Dr. Rugel, she had said one time, I believe it's... Uh, uh, on a YouTube video she did with incarcerated individuals some number of years ago, which I think is wonderful. It's gambling opiates in prison system. She did a wonderful job. And one of the things she mentioned is that gambling has the power to take you from having nothing to having something, right? And I, and I paraphrase that, but it, it, it illustrates the point that gambling can change your life in a second. And, and for someone who's in a negative state, why would they not want to change their life? Why would they not want to get out of that negative state and take an opportunity? A dollar and a dream was the New Jersey motto for the lottery, right? A dollar and a dream. So it's so difficult to get rid of and abandon intermittent schedules of reinforcement. But one of the reasons that we continually see for people who start to develop a problem with gambling or other addictions is we have to identify stressors, trauma, PTSD. I believe Dr. Chapman's on this webinar today. She does a wonderful job dealing with veterans and talking about PTSD. You know, I often think about PTSD and it never really clicked for me. And I always share that I was working downtown on September 11th when I saw that second plane hit the towers. And as some of you might know that that led me to a long journey down a path of gambling addiction, which continued for years but I never thought about the impact of seeing that and living through that trauma and losing friends because not being in the mental health field at the time, I thought I was okay. So don't worry about me. If I'm alive, I must be okay. But that's so not true. Just because I'm alive does not mean I'm okay. And so it's so important to address underlying trauma vulnerabilities, fear, pain. That's why in the bio, I do talk about the dis-ease of addiction. We talk about the disease model, but let's talk about the dis-ease. What is not at ease within us? What is making us not at ease? And we see the outward manifestation. We see the gambling. We see the drinking. We see the drug use. That's the outward sign. But what's going on at that deeper level? Some people use gambling to escape day-to-day -day problems. Other people gamble for action. And one of the early warning signs we have to be careful of is how old does someone start? Do we have a young person who's normalizing the gambling at an early age? And if that young person has a big win early, either monetarily or, and I challenge you to think outside the box here, a big win does not always have to be monetarily. It could be spending time with a loved one. If you're a person who's craving attention and craving time with parents who have increasingly busy schedules, spending time with mom or dad at the casino or the racetrack or whatever it might be, even though whether you win or lose, you don't care about that, you're spending time with someone that you look up to and that you love, that could be seen as a big win. And that can give you those good feelings later on in life when life throws you that curveball, which it always will. Let's take a quick look at the first video. And I have shared my sound here, so we are good there. Uh, this is from the BBC, and it does, it takes a look at MRI scans of someone who's actively gambling. 
to really better illustrate how the brain works within the gambling thought process. It's getting me excited already. We arranged for gambler Tony Franklin to join a unique experiment by one of the world's leading experts on addiction, Professor David Knott. Gambling addiction is not a failure of will. It is a brain disorder which is preyed upon by the gambling industry. I wish I could feel my heartbeat. <laughs> just rising, <laughs> just looking at the damn thing. Once you become addicted, it's very, very hard to stop because you have turned, you've changed your brain. Addiction is a, it is a brain that has changed to become entrained to the desires of the, of, of the gambling. So we're going to start the roulette task, Tony. This will be the first time anyone plays something similar to a fixed odds betting terminal from inside an MRI scanner. The professor says it will reveal what's happening in Tony's brain as he uses a keypad to bet. Got thousand pounds to spend. Can I spend it all on the first spin? When Tony is doing his task, when he's looking at the roulette wheel and he's making a decision to bet, parts of the brain get turned on and then they can't stop. And we think there's probably a chemical basis to that. So that's what we're expecting to see, that the habit centers are overactivated in people with gambling compared with normal people like us. The brain's not very active. Maybe a little bit here, he's thinking at the, what, you know, what should I do? But it's pretty calm. Contrast that with what happens in the next one. And that's a huge difference from indeed there to that's, there. Exactly. So that's in a matter of seconds as well, would it be? Exactly. Or? Absolutely, yes. Okay. So here we see the visual system, the back of the brain here, intensely activated. He's watching really closely. He wants that ball bearing to come down on his color. And now we look at the emotional regions. And these are different regions activated. This is the anterior cingulate cortex. This is the insula. And these are the two areas of the brain which make sense of emotions. They may generate the emotion he's feeling of excitement. Will I win? Won't I win? And here we see a very similar picture. In fact, the only real difference between winning and anticipating is this area here. And this is an area where I think we see the sense of uh, satisfaction. Yeah, I've won. That's good. Register that. Start again. But overall, winning and waiting to see if you've won, the anticipation, they're both pretty much the same. And that's a really key point about gambling. It's not just the winning that counts. It's the taking part. And the taking part repeatedly when you don't win is as activating to a gambler as the winning. When, you, when you're sitting at a fixed odd terminal, you're getting this every 20, 20 seconds. seconds. Yeah. So you can have hundreds of them. And so that process can become, in the end, it becomes kind of habitual, it becomes addictive. So I show that video and walk, I welcome chat um, for anyone who's seen that or has thoughts on that. I show that for a couple of things that he mentions. Uh, and the study is interesting because it talks about that in how intensely activated the gambler can become. The rapid reinforcement when you're making multiple bets over a very, over a prolonged period of time with a very short interval in between. And it's the win and the anticipation of the win and participating in the activity, which really matters. And I think what we're talking about today is that, that immersion that rapid reinforcement. You know, when you go to a brick and mortar establishment to gamble, if you're sitting playing cards, let's say you're playing blackjack, there are organically times when the game slows down. There might be a change in dealer. There might be a new deck of cards that has to be worked in. You could have someone buy into the table and they're putting their money down to get their chips. You can have a chip exchange or more chips come in. There are times that the action organically slows down. But with internet mobile device gambling, those all disappear. And the reason I say that also is if you think about sports betting as we move through today, there are times that when you place a sports bet and you wait for the outcome of the game, 
Well, that could be a, a three hour lag on a baseball game, right? You bet the Indians to win. Three hours later, you find out they've lost because they've traded away half their good players. Sorry, Mike. And so, you know, it really changes the dynamic of baseball and betting. But when you legalize sports betting and you have it, uh, the ability to wager on sports on a mobile device or online, now you have the ability to bet on multiple things within the game as well. Much easier, actually. In-play sports betting, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. That's that rapid reinforcement. That's the ability to make multiple bets throughout a game. So it's not just one bet. It could be hundreds of bets. It's all of those little small dopamine boosts that, you're, that you can get. It's that anticipation and the, and the reward schedule. So there's a lot going on there. So what are some of the components of internet and mobile device gambling and the impact on the gambler? And Dr. Mark Griffiths, uh, who does a lot of wonderful research around the world, um, came up with, with 10 different issues as he looked at internet and mobile device gambling that you've seen, that you can see here. Number one, and we're going to combine some of them, is that accessibility coupled with affordability. It's easy. It's in my living room. It's inexpensive. I don't have to drive anywhere. I don't have to pay for parking. I don't have to pay for gas. It's regularly, I can use it regularly. It gives me much more opportunity. I have a smartphone. It allows me ample opportunity. Okay. So this is one thing that we oftentimes will see. In New Jersey, pre-COVID, I was working on a presentation for, I'm not sure which state it was, and I was sitting at a Starbucks and there was a gentleman to my right who was on his smartphone and he was playing poker on his smartphone. And I'm doing the, my work, I'm on my laptop, not really paying much attention to him. But whenever I sit down somewhere, I don't like having anything in my pockets. I hate sitting on stuff, I hate having stuff in my pocket. So I put everything right on the table, my wallet, my keys, whatever it may be. And I had a business card for 800 Gambler and I put it right by the mouse that I had on my right side. So he looks over and he looks left and looks down at the card. And he looks at me and I look at him and he says, I don't have a gambling problem. And I said, okay, that's great. He, I think he thought I put it there because I was trying to send him a message. So he went on for the next three minutes, maybe explaining why he plays the games he plays and how, you know, he's really smart. And he's, I didn't ask for any of this information. He was oversharing and he got done. And I said, well, you know, good luck. I've, I've got to get back to doing some work here. And that was it. But it's amazing how people, when they're, they're so ingrained and entrenched in what they're doing, he went right back after he spoke to me for three minutes and he was just laser focused on that phone, intently hitting the phone, you know, staring at it so, so intently. He was so immersed. But also, I think a part of him was looking at me saying, hey, I don't have a problem. That's fine. Anonymity. You know, he can sit at that Starbucks, he can sit at a Barnes and Noble or a, a coffee shop or whatever you have, and you can gamble without fear of stigma. No one's going to yell at you, or if you make a bad decision, you can remain anonymous. And we tend to see people love to hide behind their phones, especially when they're making comments, when they're doing something that they're not too familiar with, right? It's a safe place to fail, perhaps. We hear that with a lot of kids who play video games, that they like a safe place to fail. Gaming can give them a sense of anonymity as well. What we also know about gambling is anonymity gives us a greater sense of perceived control. We think that because we're doing this and we're studying it, and we understand it quite a bit more, that we have more control over the randomness, which doesn't really make sense intuitively. But in the moment, a gambler will think, especially a problem gambler will think that they have greater sense of control if they're remaining anonymous, able to make the decisions on their own without having an outside influence. Internet gambling can lead to escape, right? It's very easy to escape. We've had a lot of reasons to want to escape this past year, past two years, whatever it might be. We have a lot of reasons. And escape can modify your mood. It makes you feel better temporarily. Escape does not fix the underlying issue, though. So if you're looking to escape a problem and you turn to drugs or alcohol or gambling, when you're done with that session of whatever you've done, that problem oftentimes is still there. I like to think of it as the problem has remained the same size, but you have now become just a little bit shorter. And so the problem seems bigger, even though the problem really hasn't changed at all. 
So we have to be very careful when we're escaping. It's okay to escape at times. We all need a safe place. We all need a little relaxation, a little break, right? But we have to be careful if we continue going, going to this thing that provides a relief from boredom that makes us feel good, because now that will become habitual and that can lead to problems. Immersion and dissociation. We understand that internet gambling can lead to longer play times, but it's not just internet gambling. Look at social media use. I can scroll on my phone looking for news or reading stories and before I know it, 30 minutes has passed if I'm not paying attention. And I just get into that flow state in my brain and I'm not paying attention and I'm just like, wow, where'd the time go? And our youth see this as well. And again, with gaming. And I know we've had Julie on, I think Julie was on last week perhaps. And you know, you start talking about gaming and, and how much time and how fast time can pass. Oh my goodness. Everything we do, when you talk digitally or electronically, whether it's gambling sites or video games, they're so beautifully created and they're so interactive and they're just marvelous and majestic that you can easily lose track of time. Being on the internet gambling also makes people less inhibited. People open up more quickly online. We tend to know that they tend to reveal themselves emotionally and at times physically faster. And when you talk about gambling, it can lead to faster spend times. It can lead to longer play times. When you're able to hook up a credit card or a banking product to a gambling site and you're not really paying attention to that deposit, right? Because it's electronic. You know, we're, there's nothing tangible. So you lose track of how much are you really spending. We know around the holiday times that people who spend money on plastic instead of cash, they might get those bills come January and say, oh my gosh, how much did I spend? What was I thinking, right? So it makes us less inhibited. But also we have event frequency and this starts to really become problematic because when we talk about the frequency of play and the speed and the repetition and the velocity, how fast you're playing through each hand, those are some of the structural characteristics that can become problematic. And that's where we're starting to see more in the emerging trend of sports betting. We're seeing that frequency picking up. Those microtransactions, those small bets constantly throughout a game, the ability to do that keeps someone really immersed. The length of time between each gambling event can be critical to developing gambling problems, okay? I often think about the concept from substance use, you have someone who will swallow a pill and it might take a bit for it to react with the body. You inject something into your veins, it's gonna react a lot quicker. And when we think about the potential harm for some people who struggle with gambling problems, internet gambling is that syringe compared to the say brick and mortar or slower play um, versions of gambling where there's more time component in between. Not for everyone. Remember, we're talking about problem gambling here. And we wanna be very careful that we don't say all gambling can create this. It's not. As it showed in the video, people, with a, people will process gambling differently. For a problem gambler, they're gonna process it a lot differently than someone who's a social responsible gambler, which makes up a majority of the United States population. So we want to be very careful that we're always aligned with the fact that we're talking about problem gambling, but some characteristics might move the needle along the continuum so that we might be exposing more people that were at risk can be moving them along the continuum to problem gambling. So it's the at-risk population that we really need to be careful of, okay? When we talk about interactivity, simulation, asociability, some things, and these were the remaining three that Dr. Griffiths talked about, was the nature of isolation, right? So if you, some people like to play games in isolation, it might be Farmville, it might be Candy Crush, they were super popular, they're not gambling games, they're social games, okay? But there are social games you can play with others, you can play by yourself, they're not gambling, but you can spend money on these games. But then you have gambling simulated games. So no real money, but still things that you can do by yourself on your phone. And we tend to see that if people are playing in isolation, they tend to think they have a higher chance of winning. They tend to spend more time. They tend to spend more dollars on in-app purchases. And this is all potentially problematic, especially when we talk about today's youth. Because if there's no one to kind of talk them through their thought process, because remember the 
prefrontal cortex is the last part that develops, which is the decision-making piece. So if they're making decisions on their own without guidance, they're going to come out with some uh, maybe flawed thinking, stinking thinking, fallacies, whatever you want to call it, on how gambling generally works. They might be learning it from their friends. They might be learning it from YouTube videos between systems and processes in order to win money. So we have to be very careful when we talk about all of these elements of internet gambling, whether it's real money or just play for fun kind of money, where's the education along the way? You know, how do we make sure that our youth are not spending too much time on that? And even as parents that we're not spending too much time as well. So let's get into sports betting and emerging trends as we move through the morning, because this is an area that's seen tremendous growth, tremendous opportunity across the board. Uh, Dr. Griffiths and uh, Dr. Lopez Gonzalez in 2016 did a research study looking to understand the market characteristics between of online sports betting. So they wanted to understand what is this convergence between various markets and the online sports betting market? You know, how does it intersect? Where are we starting to see sports betting popping up in areas where maybe it never popped up before? So let's break this down into three different areas. Let's take a look at the online piece. So what does it mean online? Ohio is in a state right now of, of waiting, right? Wait and see what will happen with sports betting. But there are many states, as I showed you early on, 15, as of February 1st, that had an online gambling component. That's the digital integration. That's now decentralizing, if you will, the use of brick and mortar to gamble and now bringing it to a mobile device. So we've almost decentralized gambling. That was a term we actually used yesterday in Washington State when, when myself, James Syfax, and Keith White were talking about day trading and cryptocurrency, about that decentralization. We've had this in the gambling world for a number of years now, okay? But it makes everything uh, almost uh, uh, the ability to monetize anything. So now you have all of these factors that go into online sports betting, such as data. Data is critical for the sports better because how else are you going to try to pick who you're going to gamble on if you can't study statistics, if you can't study the past results, if you can't study the data, the three-point field goals made, the number of touchdowns thrown, number of interceptions thrown by Baker Mayfield in a game. Sorry, that's number two. I will not do any more Ohio sport jokes today. But there's also clothing and chip sensors, right? So now you have clothing companies like Nike and Reebok and Under Armour, test marketing sensors that will detect sweat levels and perspiration in an athlete's skin. And you can transmit that real time. So if there's a player who's coming up and showing as being dehydrated, then maybe on the next play, you don't want to bet something that involves that player. Maybe you want to bet on the defense that they're going to stop him. It gets so hard to fathom the depths that you can use and monetize so many intricate pieces of information. The online world makes almost anything possible. A couple months ago, I would not have brought this up, but even in the world of online sports collectibles, not even betting, there are these things called non-fungible tokens, NFTs. We talked about it yesterday and quite simply, Basically, anyone on the webinar today who has heard of baseball cards or basketball cards, you open up a pack, you look through your cards, you're hoping for some, hoping to get somebody that you really like. Imagine opening, getting a digital version of a tangible card, right? Getting a digital version of a card. And now you have that in your possession. You can share it with your friends on your phone. You don't physically touch anything. It's on your phone. And some of those things are selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a crazy different world. But when we talk about online, when we talk about digital integration across so many intersecting points and sports, it makes anything up for grabs. It could be esports. Esports has been taking off. Another form of sport is competitive video gaming in real time. That's an area that's seen tremendous growth. Social gaming and sport games, the Madden tournaments, monetizing. You can monetize anything, but what is it worth? It's worth basically what someone will pay for it. It throws economics as we think about it on its head. I have an economics minor, and when I think about digital products and I think about supply and demand, it's really a fascinating, fascinating thought. 
The next component of online sports betting is the sports component, right? So when we talk about online sports betting, where do we see sports and the concept of gambling popping up more? The first place I really thought about it was before COVID was when the XFL had relaunched their season. And in part, they were having some early success because of the gambling markets, the ability to wager on sub sub-professional games. XFL is not the NFL, right? So these are players who couldn't make it in the NFL or they used to play in the NFL. And you can wager on these. And at the bottom of the screen on every game, you can see real-time odds that were updated. You can see sponsorship from casinos. When you go over to the UK and you watch soccer matches, you can see that more than half of the teams in the English Premier League are sponsored by gambling companies. So we're seeing the integration between gambling and sport from a marketing perspective. The TV shows that we now see, journalism, there's podcasts on sports betting, there's TV shows, there's handicapping shows, 30 minutes on which team should we pick. We know March Madness is right around the corner starting Thursday. That's a big time the next three weeks for people gambling. So you see odds, they're more mainstream, okay? Sponsorships, endorsements, we're seeing it more mainstream. And then the gambling integration component. I think about the stadiums. When people start returning to stadiums, as, as we look out in the not so distant future, imagine going to a Cincinnati Bengals game and downloading an app for your phone where you can have any number of options. You might wanna check on your car in the parking lot, make sure it's still okay because there was a wild tailgate party going on and you wanna make sure someone didn't put the grill underneath your gas tank. So you wanna make sure your car didn't explode. You might also wanna order some merchandise from your seat. You don't wanna get up and miss the game. So you order the merchandise. You might wanna order food from your seat. You also might wanna place some bets from your seat. And so on an online app, you have the ability to do any number of things without even leaving your seat. The gambling component gets integrated into the online component. Two emerging structural characteristics of online sports gambling that have caught a lot of attention, and I mentioned them before, and we need to spend a few moments on these. In-play betting and the early cash out feature. These are two areas that would become really problematic for someone who already struggles with a gambling addiction or someone can find themselves developing a gambling problem if we're reinforcing the activity so much so quickly. So let's talk about in-play sports betting. Does it have uh, the potential to become more harmful? Absolutely. It can be crucial in acquiring a problem. It can be crucial in maintaining a problem. And the development of a problem for online gambling can occur more rapidly because of the rapid reinforcement. I, I just want that underlying theme that we saw from that early video to continue to stand out, right? It's that rapid reinforcement. It's that intensity, that speed, that velocity. In-play sports betting, as I mentioned, allows for a large number of bets throughout a game instead of just one bet on the outcome. It shortens that reward schedule. Instead of waiting three hours, we're now down to minutes. Time was our protective factor. Time is now being removed. And so now we're left to those intermittent reward schedules being reinforced potentially faster. There's also the element of an illusion of control in in-place sports betting. Because if you think about a gambler with this style of betting, he or she can dictate the speed of the bets, dictate the amount of money that has been wagered, the volume or the number of bets, and that can all lead to maintaining a gambling problem, an illusion of control. They may experience a false sense of success expectancy because if someone's watching a game, they oftentimes will think that they know a little bit more about what's going to happen next as if they were not watching the game. So they might tend to take more chances. They might make more bets. They might increase the dollar value of the bets. Gambling addiction is no different than substance in the way that tolerance, right? When you have someone who starts off with a dollar bet, that dollar bet over time does not give the same level of excitement. So now it has to go to $2 or maybe $5 or maybe $100 over time. Same way that someone who starts consuming alcohol might do so with, a, I don't know, a bottle of beer, and it can progress over time to 
a 30 pack, shots, right? Multiple things. So our body has the ability to adapt. And it's as that adaptation occurs, we continue to look for this new high, this new action, this new escape. We have to fill it in different ways. I know for, for those of you that, that have heard me speak in the past, and I, I've talked about September 11th, and that led to a long battle with gambling addiction, which it ended thankfully on February 11th, 2010. It's been over 11 years since I've felt the need to place a bet, and I'm very thankful for that. But it did not start where it ended. And I also know from people in recovery that if they were to ever pick up and try to resume gambling or drinking or drugging, they don't go back to that very first day where they first started. They're going to try to go back to where they left off and oftentimes find that they can't. And so that becomes very problematic. And that's why return to use is a real part of recovery for a lot of people. But that initiation point of where they enter and that return to use is also very critical to kind of understand. So we have to realize that when we work with people in recovery from addiction, if they do return to use, we need to understand what are they using? Where are they returning? Which point along the process are they returning to? And again, what were those triggers that led them? We're starting to see more people calling our helpline that were in recovery from drug and alcohol that are now getting involved with sports betting because it's providing a very similar rush and excitement. Different chemically, we understand that because you're not putting anything in your body, but the experience for some of them has been very similar. We've also found a number of people participating in day trading. We're getting increasing number of people calling with day trading, which is a little bit out of scope for today, but has very similar features to in-place sports betting or rapid reinforcement gambling because of the blinking lights, the action, the preoccupation, the continuous reinforcement of being able to buy and sell, buy and sell. Have you ever thought of in-place sports betting as day trading? Because you're rapidly buying and selling the ability to wager on a sporting event. It could be a quarter, it could be a play, it could be a next series of downs. You buy the bet. If it doesn't work out your way, you can also close out your bet. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute because that's called early cash out feature. So in-play wagering leads to high speed and continuous reinforcement. It can lead to micro boosts and micro bursts of dopamine. We call that the digital dopamine drip a digital dopamine drip, similar to when you get a like on a social media post or somebody comments, it makes you feel good. It gives us just this little drip and we, it makes us feel like we matter. It makes us feel good, right? It impacts people differently. But when you have continuous reinforcement and a continuous reward schedule, the gambler lacks that time component for reflection. Remember I said time is the protective factor. That's gone because it's continuous action, it's constant, it's preoccupation, it's isolation, it's immersive. But if you have the ability to wager in the middle of a game, you also have the ability to cash out in the middle of the game as well. Take a look at this definition from Betfair. Cash out lets you take your profit early if your bet is coming in or get some of your stake back if your bet is going against you all before the event you're betting on is over. Cash out offers are made in real time on your current bets based on live market prices. You know, and I, and I read this and I think there's several things that jump out to me in that first few sentences. Um, the word profit is used, lets you take your profit early. That implies an investment strategy. Uh, you're able to get some of your stake back if your bet is going against you, that implies that you've made the right decision. It just went against you, right? So the language is interesting. And then it's the offers to cash out are based on live market prices. Again, that seems like some type of investment strategy. We recently did a study and are in the midst of doing a study with Seton Hall University here in New Jersey. And we're looking to do a prevalence study on sports betting amongst 18 to 25 year olds. And the first step was to do a qualitative study in which they interviewed 25 or so college age students, male and female. And in no cases, not one case, 
did any of them describe sports betting as gambling? They described it as easy money, a way to make ends meet, a way to pay bills, a way to get even when they're down from other forms of actual gambling, a fun time with friends. Those were the five most popular responses when they started talking about sports betting. They don't see it as gambling, and that's a concern. And when you look at the fandom status, a lot of these, when they're talking about gambling on your favorite team, a majority of the students felt as if they would make money very easily over the long term because they follow the team so closely, so they know more about what's going on than someone who doesn't. So they could easily make more money over the long term. That thinking is concerning because you've got a developing brain, you've got some irrational beliefs, you've got some uh, concerning answers. And I'm interested as to what the next couple months bring as we start doing a larger prevalence study around the state of New Jersey and start understanding a bit more what we're really looking at. Cash out actually makes sports betting feel more like an investment decision than a, than a gamble. And this is where we talk about marketing matters. It does. How you market something, how you talk about it, language matters. We talk about stigma. We talk about marketing, the power of language. It all matters. Early cash out changes the thinking from gambling to investing. It's no longer sports betting or a skill-based form of gambling like poker. It's more about skillful money management. You see, there's been a shift somehow here. And I just caution Ohio. As we think and as we look as sports betting expands, there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of areas that you need to be sure of that are implemented to make sure that resources are available for people who start experiencing that percentage, that small percentage of people who experience gambling related harms like we're seeing in New Jersey, that resources are available. The network of treatment providers, the helplines, the online resources, the podcasts, right? The Zoom meeting rooms, whatever's available, use them, have them available because people will call. And when they call because that window is open and they're looking for help, they're gonna look for answers. What are the benefits? Because we also want to understand that when we talk about the expansion of sports betting, that when you offer in play and cash out, I, I, I always try to think of everything from both ends. You know, one, I love to think about gambling as the business perspective, but also be there to support the loved ones and the problem gamblers. From an operator perspective, in play sports betting and early cash out reduces volatility of revenue. It allows you to kind of have a better feel for how much money or how much you'll be making on a particular game. It also then allows the player, the gambler, to bank smaller returns and oftentimes they recycle that into another bet. A person who cashes out their bet early is not going to take the money and put it back in their bank account most times. It's going to be back in their gambling account and then they're going to turn around and bet it on something else. Okay, This allows the player to avoid the near miss if they were to let the bet go and they just lose by a half a point on the point spread, they can close out their bet early and it improves player engagement. The one thing you can think about for early cash out, remember the show Deal or No Deal? Howie Mandel, the player would be on the stage taking cases off the stage. And then based upon the dollar amount that was opened in that case, the banker would give the player an offer. And the whole goal was to try to win a million dollars. So at the very end of the game, you wanted to have one case left on that stage. And if it was a million dollars, that's what you want. But every time you took down those big prizes, the amount of money left on the stage was small. So the banker would give you an offer to stop playing the game now and walk away with the money. That's essentially what's happening on the ability for early cash out. It allows you to take what you have now and close the bet out, right? It's a trade. Do you accept the banker's offer or do you want to let it go knowing that you might get nothing? Cashing out and in-play wagering takes sports betting from a discontinuous form of gambling to a continuous form of gambling. And that's what we highlighted since the start of the webinar continuous forms of gambling are rapidly increasing and they can become problematic. We talked about the immediate gratification, the increased frequency can exasperate a condition. 
the reward being replaced by every few hours to every few minutes. And the online gambling can become, quote unquote, the syringe versus the traditional gambling pill. It hits with faster impact. So as we look through here, how do we keep it safe? How do we keep it responsible? How do we look at sports betting in a safer way? Nikasa put from Illinois, Nikasa Behavioral Health, put out a four minute video, which I wanted to share, which I thought was just so well done. And it really summarizes what we know and where we kind of want to get to and just enjoy sports for the love of the game. You know, we have a number of people. Last night I spoke to that mom and she, we were sharing stories and she said her son was, always has loved sports and he loves watching sports and he doesn't know how to stop sports betting. And I asked her, does he love watching sports because he bets on them? Or does he love watching sports just for the love of the game? Because myself, when I stopped gambling, I realized I didn't love sports as much as I thought I did when I didn't have action on it. Yes, I'm a Yankees fan. Yes, I'm a New York Giants fan. But I don't need to be watching random games on a Saturday afternoon where I have no interest in. I don't love sports as much as I thought I did when there's no gambling on it. Take a look at this four minute video and then we'll wrap up with a few slides before we get to questions. I'm scared I'm wasting my time, scared I'm losing control of my life. I'm scared of commitment of calling anything mine. I will be lying if I told you I'm fine. Serving these tables to put some food in my stomach. I'm tired of seeing my mom and say no worry, it's coming. My heart is racing. I'm running to anything more than nothing. Drowning in debt and I'm trying to pull us above it. Tell me everything will be okay. Tell me why does everybody gotta fade away? Am I crossing your mind? Cause you've been all up in mind. But if I saw you, I don't know what I would say. Instead of being together, I need to get it together. Instead of writing these letters, I want to live to remember. Am I better from the past? Yeah, I wonder when I'll know. Haunted by dream is when you really let it go. I guess things happen for a reason, but I'ma never leave anything a chance. At first glance, I'm looking for God's hands. The devil's looking at me like, homie, come dance. My grandma's getting sick, I'm never there when I can be. See my brother feeling lost, I guess it runs in the family. People telling me this music should be a plan B. How could you judge me if you don't understand me? No breaks, 120 going in. Destiny's calling, I'm like, baby, come on in. Right now it feels like do or die. Every day is who am I? You calling out a fire, man, I call it suicide. I see what they can't see, this is all that I can be. Rather be homeless and broke than be labeled as happy. They don't understand me, cause no one can stand me. It's always the outsiders who end up outstanding. I lost $100 on a bet. It's not a lot of money, but it said a lot about me. In a moment, guess I didn't understand it. When nothing is certain, don't ever take it for granted. Pride is a poison that infested our planet. Greed is okay, well that's the way that they brand it. Our view of everything is such a mess. Having less than we deserve is our perception of happiness. What am I supposed to do? They say follow the steps, stick to the guidelines. If I listen to that, I'm just a kid on the sideline. What's in your eyes? I don't care about your eyeline. Never cared about all of that. Money got people snapping for the quarterback. If I get it, I'ma give it back. I feel like happiness is something everybody should have. in the dark well i've been shooting for stars looking for love like is it really the harder just have someone who's there when it's all falling apart but every scar only makes your heart stronger hold on just fight a little longer i ponder these lines when mopping floors every night that's when you feel the fatigue and all your hunger it's been killing me keep going with it telling me more regrets than memory sometimes you gotta let it be the past ain't ahead of me i gotta get my best how do I make change if I don't give you my two cents? I look around, I see the dying of youth. Why you picking up a bottle? Let me pour you the truth. I used to be like all of you, like you got nothing to lose. Nobody want a commitment when everybody's been used. Step in my conscience, my heart is the pilot. The past is behind you, but lately I've been behind and I find I've been placing happiness in people who leave. Yeah, they love it when you're broken, hate you when you achieve. It's like I can never be me. The world is just a routine. Telling you how to live in the certain value it brings. Like rings, summer flings, things ain't what they seem. So don't you ever buy the happiness that's out on the screen. Cause happiness ain't a store by can And 
love isn't found in just a one night dance I'm looking at the sky like give me one more chance I'm tired of sitting in my room like I know I can Nothing's done until you do it Just look who what I'm pursuing They doubt it like what you do with my girl Because of my music it was lose or lose it My heart's to the music If I didn't I'd be dead so I wouldn't I choose it I'm Trying to figure it out and this ain't even about us. I'm trying to be something more. Some of my kids can be proud of. I'm trying to show everybody there's so much worth in these dollars. I hear making a difference. Don't you give up. Every line that I'm writing is just for you to get up. Love is barely enough. Yeah, we don't give it enough. Man, what's the point of the top if nobody wants to look up? So look up. Look up. Don't look down. Look up. Look up, don't look down. I watched that video and I just think it was so well done uh, in the sense that it highlights what we know about the areas of concern. And, you know, we, 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 we consume sports, not for the love of the game, but for the love of that opportunity to make the money that some people who fall into the addiction of gambling do. And that's what we want to be careful of. We want to promote responsible gambling, but more importantly, we want to help those who have a problem by providing resources so that they can create a healthy way of living, a healthier way of living. You know, one, one area that's always important, I, I always say it's, it's, you don't want to just keep gambling out of your life when you have a problem. You want to create a new life where the gambling no longer fits in. And it's a big difference of thinking not just about keeping it out because we'll get tired of pushing things out of our life. When you can create a new life where gambling no longer fits in, it becomes a lot easier. I mentioned at the start that one of my favorite phrases is rules without relationships leads to rebellion. And I find that apply in so many different areas of life. I grew up in a house where my father always yelled the rules really loud. He was German and Portuguese and the German really came through. And everything was a handshake. There was no hugs, nothing, none of that stuff. It was a lot of rule following. And as a young person, I followed the rules. I didn't want to be yelled at. I was a rule follower. But over time, we never really had the relationship. Um, I was being talked at instead of spoken with. And I didn't like that. And over time, I started rebelling. And you know, I think about that in so many different ways that when you don't take the time to develop a relationship then respect is not traded, right? A young person will only conform to rule shouting for so long before they start pushing back on the rules. And a lot of that has to do with we need to build a relationship. And in addiction recovery, if you're so focused on following the rules of a program that are written in a book, but you don't develop a relationship with the program, the person runs the risk of rebelling. And I often encourage clinicians to really stress that to people that they see. Develop a relationship with this program. Don't just follow the rules. It's a relationship. So how do we gamble responsibly as we go through just watching that sports betting video? And I hope you enjoyed that. Decide ahead, right? That's one way to do it. These are, these are, the, these are ways to develop a healthy relationship with gambling, if you will, right? Decide ahead. How much time are you going to spend? How much money? Play knowing that it's a form of entertainment. Over the long term, you will not win. And you're often going to lose more times than you will win. So just understand to play responsibly. Play with what you can afford to use as entertainment. Make informed decisions about your gambling. Know the odds, right? It's a form of entertainment, not a way to make money. And if you win big, enjoy it. But you also have to be very centered and down to earth knowing that that may never happen again. That real big win early financially can be that feeling a person chases and they might lose that money 10 times over chasing that feeling. So as we summarize today, before we leave some time for Q&A, you know, we, we've talked about that, that, that illusion of control, the ability to have my skill influencing versus just the randomness, right? Randomness is such, and the random reward and the random reinforcement is so hard to abandon Okay, I think my skill matters. I might bet more money or take more chances. The intermittent reinforcement, the social aspect, what I shared with those Seton Hall qualitative study of those students, it's a, sports betting is an easy way to make money. It's a great time with friends. There's no, not one of the 25 mentioned anything negative 
no negative feelings, negative thoughts, negative behaviors, negative emotions. It was fascinating. And then why do people play games and gamble? Very simply, I like having five E's and then my five A's. My five E's, the excitement, the entertainment, to escape, the economics, and also that ego, especially with sports betting. People love to talk about how they were able to handicap a game and I knew that team would win. Oh, I can't believe you didn't win that one. Of course, the, you know, the Browns were gonna beat the Cardinals, okay? And then the five A's to the perfect storm of gambling. When we start looking at the age of people who start, the availability through internet and mobile device, we know gambling is socially acceptable. We know the advertising is really taking off and the access to cash and credit card is becoming more widely available. Those are the five areas we really need to be honing in on and be really careful as we explore the future of gambling. Mike, I'll turn it back over to you or Corey um, to see um, how we did and uh, anything from the chat. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Corey is gonna launch a poll for the attendees and we'll just give that one second here for them to view and select and then we will get into some questions, but I'll just uh, have some comments. Great information as always. Um, I mean, some of my initial reactions were, I mean, being uh, a former collegiate athlete and an avid sports person, and I mean, I'm like you, I, I won't watch a random game between random teams, but I do, you know, I'm an avid, avid sports watcher for my teams. Um, and it, you know, it's concerning, but it's also just from my perspective, sad that you can't watch a game or a match or whatever it is, depending on the sport without being bombarded with ads and discussion about gambling. It's, it's, it's just sad. And one thing you mentioned, the XFL, it was having some success and whether that was because the NFL was out of season or because of the integration of live gambling, um, on the screen, I also did hear something interesting that the XFL sent all their broadcasters before the season to a gambling boot camp in Las Vegas to learn about sports gambling lingo so they could talk about it. So the broadcast of XFL games was half what was going on on the field and half watching the lines and the odds change. And they spoke about it just as fluently as they were the game. And it's because they went to a boot camp to kind of learn that. So it really shows the emphasis they were putting on the gambling and that integration to make it so normalized, almost to the point where you can't have a, a game without it. Um, some questions that came in were kind of uh, maybe a little bit more you could give about the tolerance, um, you know, where the tolerance is coming from. So Joy asked, um, I just want to read it correctly um, about um, when we were talking about, you know, is, is the tolerance building up with a gambler like other drugs or substances of choice? Is it gambling more often? Is it gambling more money? Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the tolerance and its role? Sure. Yeah. And I like, I like illustrating that and I'll, and I'll share my experience on how my tolerance um, increased over time. Uh, and others that, that I've spoken with. You know, we talk about tolerance increasing. You know, you, I remember when I first started gambling, it was with my father at the age of 12, and we would bet a dollar on the NFL games. We'd all put my doll, my father, my brother, and myself would all put a dollar on the kitchen table, and we would pick the games for that Sunday. And whoever picked the most games right won the $3 pot, okay? And so that felt good. It was a reason to stay in action, and it was great. As I moved along my journey with gambling, I started betting on dollar on sports. I bet a dollar on the Giants to win 91 cents. I'd bet $2 on the Jets, you know. But then over time, and I can't pinpoint it because it's kind of a moving target. Over time, I would say, okay, it really doesn't make me feel any kind of way. I don't, let me try $5 on this one. Let me do $10 on this one, okay? Oh, I have a good feeling about this. Let me do 15. So gradually over time, the amount of money I was willing to risk in order to keep me interested in watching the game, the amount of money started increasing. But then besides the money, I also had to start betting more games. So it was tolerance was money. It was the amount of time I spent researching. I was spending more time looking at which games to bet on. And then I was 
spending more, betting on more games. So more actual dollars across the entire board of games, not just on the one game, but now I had 10 games, right? And then it went from sports betting to the fact that my tolerance, I hated waiting three hours for the outcome of a game. What am I going to do? Watch the game? No, that's crazy. I'm going to now open up an online casino account and I'm going to be playing blackjack the entire time the game is going on until I get my outcome. So it was the tolerance just kept building. I needed to constantly fuel myself with action and, and or escape because that was still dealing with September 11, not in a healthy way either. And so I hear when we talk to people on our helpline, we hear similar patterns of people kind of escalating, right? Despite negative consequences, the tolerance from time, money, volume of bets, it, everything just started picking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also thought, um, thank you for that. And everyone's chatting in great information, great information. You provided so much. And we put in the chat there, um, uh, the author of the video, which a lot of people are saying they, they got a lot of that out of that video. And I really liked the ending message of the video. Look up, don't look down, you know, meaning look, look at the game as opposed to your phone. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's really interesting. I, I have some, some folks I know that are, are very heavy sports gamblers and one they'll never use the term gambling or gamble it's it's money on this or whatnot and it really seems their behavior and the way they discuss it is going to investing moving players around in their multiple fantasy leagues and um the ability to to cash out early if necessary hedge betting all this sorts of stuff it's really becoming an investment and that's the way they talk about it and the way they look at it um and that can really mask the problematic behavior because it seems like it, it's almost becoming you know a career to them that their their job is secondary right the what they can do at nights or on weekends is really where they're making their money and it's it, it's interesting to see where it comes in our state when if and when more likely when um this becomes available um, i just want to add mike also that you know you, you highlight something that we're seeing across the the nation and i know you and i have talked about this with others on the prevention team etc the word gambling some people to your point don't think of what they're doing as gambling right i'm running a team i'm spending money and, and we've started adjusting the questions that we ask our clinicians to ask to say how much money have you spent on and then we list oh, yeah. the activities lottery horses casinos sports right how much money have you spent? And also how much time have you spent? Because mm -hmm. we're seeing that preoccupation becomes a really critical factor. And you can really identify quickly, okay, you're spending lots of time on this activity, but you're saying you're not gambling. Talk to me a little bit more about why you'd be spending so much time on something that you're not gambling on. Yeah. And then oftentimes you find out, well, it's not gambling. I'm, I'm researching. Um, I'm an expert. I'm investing. Oh, yeah. I'm managing, right? So that the word gambling is something like my uncle used to do. I don't mm -hmm. gamble. I'm mm -hmm. a professional here. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned, you know, uh, in there being able to predict the outcome and things like that. Um, I think that's, uh, well, that's a great, that's a great segue to our listening session about screening and assessment. But I mean, it, it goes to how quickly this, this field has changed over time and the rapid progression it will continue to do. Because I remember talking about, the importance of language on screens and assessments with people to not say, do you gamble? Because people will just say no. But if you say, do you play the lottery? People will always say, well, yeah, I buy lottery tickets now and again, or I visit the casino maybe so and so times a year. It's nothing big, but well, you just said you don't gamble. So you can't come out and say, do you gamble? You know, that's what we used to talk about a couple of years ago. Do you play lottery? Do you do this? But to your point, that's a great question. How much time or how much money do you spend on this activity and list them out because that is going to be so important moving forward with with whether it's a hybrid or integration of gambling and investing and robin hood and all this stuff i mean I, the word gambling is really it's interesting that we might be in a field and in a time where the word gambling doesn't even exist inside of our problem gambling field because so many folks who it affects don't view it as as what it is and really there's still that stigma, right? There's still that stigma. Yeah. Dr. Chapman, I was just uh, looking at the chat really quick, and Dr. Chapman threw out the word stigma, and I think about that too, because when you talk about day trading, for example, you're viewed as very successful when you can produce. I'll share a quick story. I know we're bumping up against time. I had a, a friend of mine who went to his account to do his taxes a number of years ago, and he produced 
hundreds of pages for his accountant for all day trade transactions, right? I mean, all the buy sell, it generated hundreds of tax forms. The accountant said, wow, you were really successful. You're really smart. You're doing a great job. If he would have gone with hundreds of pages of gambling transactions, right? All in play sports bets, cashing it. Do you think the accountant would have had the same response of you being successful? He would have said, you need help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's this stigma for very similar behavioral like activities that are viewed completely differently. Investing is a noble cause and you're looked to be a very smart person if you make money in the market. If you gamble too much or make money, you got a problem. Yeah. 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 The activity still, the stigma still around, you know, the dirtiness of it or the immorality of it from, from a long time ago. It's interesting. Last year, James Holtzauer on Jeopardy, he almost brought to light because he would always talk about it because he was on Jeopardy for how many days in a row, 50 days in a row, whatever. And he talked about the way he did it was not so much a gamble in his eyes, but an investment. Um, that's really interesting. Well, yeah. Great, great info in the chat saying thanks so much, Dan. Great information. Everybody enjoyed the presentation.